Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 302, I chat with video guru Joe Kane about his views on high dynamic range. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for home theater geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded April 28th, 2016, episode 302. Joe Kane on HDR. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all in one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is Joe Kane, video consultant and who I like to call video guru, the person I listen to most carefully about anything relating to video. Hey, Joe, welcome back to the show. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, those of you who are tuned in live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv can post questions as we go and I'll pass along as many as I can. Be sure to use my screen name, which is my full name, Scott Wilkinson, spelled out, no dots or dashes, uh, because that way it'll show up in a different color on my screen and my eye will be more naturally drawn to it. So, Joe, I wanted to have you on today to talk about your impressions from NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters Conference that we were both at last week. And um, there was an awful lot to see there, wasn't there? There certainly was. And, of course, it was um, six days because there were two days uh, ahead of the exhibits. The Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers um, presented in conjunction with NAB a conference on digital cinema. And it's always full of interesting and recent things going on in the industry. And, of course, the main event there was Ang Lee uh, presenting basically a new 3D format that um, he's been using. Yes, as you can see, the lines waiting to see the demonstrations. Um, yeah, this was amazing. <laughs> the, at, how long show. people waited in line to see this 10, 11 minute clip. Yeah, I think we, his... yeah, we waited in line at least 45 minutes to see that clip. Yeah, exactly. So. It's from, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, it's from Ang Lee's uh, upcoming movie called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Long name for a movie, long title, but same title as the novel on which it is based. And uh, Joe, tell us about w why that particular demo and this movie uh, is so important. One of the things that's important, um, and, uh, technologically, one of the things that's important about this movie is that it was shot in a true 4K format, 4096 by 2160. And it was shot in stereo, meaning 3D. And it was shot at 120 hertz. That's 120 the frames per second. Yes, that was as fast. That's as fast as we've gone. I mean, uh, James Cameron has talked about wanting to go to 60. Well, Ang Lee is doing 120. And <laughs> of course, there isn't there isn't very much flicker at 120 hertz. I would uh, say not. I didn't see any at all. It is it is the most realistic stereo 3D most of us have ever seen between mm -hmm. the resolution of the display and the frame rate of the display. It, it was an absolutely spectacular presentation. Uh, there were a number of people who told me it was the very best video they had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And so I congratulate him for uh, moving forward in technology. Of course, with Life of Pi, he did um, he did 3D and he did it uh, extremely well. And that was one of the now, that's certainly one of the best 3D images I've ever seen. Life of Pi. Yeah. So he's upping the game, if if that if that's the correct uh, 
term for it. He's he's doing a a, a better job than anyone else uh, is doing in producing high quality content. And interestingly, he said during his keynote that he had actually been inspired by Douglas Trumbull, who has been an advocate for high frame rates and 3D and higher spatial resolution for a long time. Um, and in fact, Doug Trumbull, who was a guest on my podcast, actually, the last show of 2015 in December, uh, said that he had invited Ang Lee out to his studio, which he had built specifically to show off these technologies. And Ang Lee was so impressed that uh, he ended up convincing Sony Pictures, I believe, is the studio that's behind it, uh, behind this movie, to let him shoot in at 120 frames per second, native 3D, uh, native stereo, I should say, stereoscopic, uh, <clears throat> and at 4K. And what we saw was was really remarkable. I, I can't agree with you more. But the the next question is. Will anybody else besides those 600 some odd people who waited in line 45 minutes to see this 11 minute clip, will anybody in, in the general public be able to see it in that format completely? I think the answer to that, uh, from my point of view, is eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not uh, right away. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. That he has actually exceeded the capabilities of what modern digital projection can do at the moment. At, at the moment. And um, it, I think it's important to exceed capabilities. I think it's important to push forward. And high frame rate is one of the considerations for the ultra high definition uh, television system. Mm. Now, interestingly enough, among the things that occurred, the, uh, light levels coming off the screen and through the glasses were said to be about 100 nits, uh, which is twice the light output capability of most theaters. Most theaters run around 48 nits or 14 mm -hmm. foot Lamberts if you're back in the foot Lamberts world. Exactly. But, uh, he was running through 3D glasses, he was running at twice the light output in standard dynamic range. Those pictures were standard dynamic range. Yes, that, wasn't that amazing? That That is so unbelievably impressive that yes. he was able to do this in standard dynamic range at mm -hmm. cinema levels for high dynamic range. Yes, yes. Um, I... I was amazed, too, that that he said 28 foot Lamberts to the eye. That's through the glasses, uh, as opposed to normal theatrical 3D, which is maybe three or four foot Lamberts. <laughs> so and as you say, it's twice as bright as 2D digital cinema. So it was quite astonishing. Now, let me ask you this about that particular type of 3D, which is called spectrum separation or Dolby 3D, where the two it, and there were he used two projectors. And each of them was reproducing a red, green, and blue that was slightly different from the other one. And the filters in the glasses let only one set of RGB into the right and the other set into the left. Um, <clears throat> I find that in the other Dolby 3D situations, I because I wear prescription glasses, I put those glasses over it, I, I get these weird internal reflections that kind of put halos around the screen and some double imaging. Uh, you don't wear glasses, so do you see that in a, in a Dolby 3D or a spectrum separation 3D situation? Well, what I see, if the theater has any light behind me, that light will come in from around the sides, and I will actually see light behind uh, me. When yes. I had put those glasses on, when the lights were still on, mm -hmm. it, it was effectively um, had taken back off. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there was so much light coming in from behind, reflecting off the inside of the glasses back into my eyes. Yes. So you you have one sort of a problem because you're wearing glasses. I have a general problem with glasses themselves if there's mm -hmm. any light on in the room. Yeah. And even if there had been exit signs um, to the left and right, um, I suspect the green or the red from the exit signs would have uh, come into the glasses as well. Mm -hmm. So that, the, that is my one difficult uh, 
my one difficulty with the um, Dolby approach. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I prefer the Dolby approach uh, to the other passive system. Polarization. Correct. Um, but what I what I wanted to say was that in this particular example, with with so with the image being so much brighter, I did not see that. My normal uh, problem that I have with these glasses, I didn't see a halo around the screen. I didn't see double images, and I would have thought it might have been worse with more light. But it, I'm guessing, and no one there knew the answer, that maybe because it was so much brighter that that it that it didn't have that problem. It's it was quite surprising to me certainly the best 3d image i've ever seen and i certainly i'm not alone in that assessment i uh, no, you're not as, as i stated uh, people i talked to told me it was the best video they'd ever seen mm -hmm. and i'm i tend to agree with them that uh, mm -hmm. they haven't seen 4k at 120 hertz at mm -hmm. 2d let alone 3d so right i i feel they're probably uh, correct in that it, it, it is the best video that they've ever seen. Yeah. Chickenhead21 is asking, did you did you get to see it multiple times? I tried, and there were so many people waiting who hadn't seen it once. I was told, well, you know, it's probably, let's give everybody else a chance. Um, I agree that um, it, it was difficult to see it uh, more than once. Now, interestingly enough to me, um, and I believe it was an eight meter, eight meter wide screen. Uh, in the discussions afterwards, the editor of the material made a point of saying that this larger screen made it much easier for him to see things that are in the movie. So if the person asking the question is asking, so what did you see and how much would you see if you saw this again? Mm -hmm. uh, the presentation itself uh, according to the editor, allowed him to see things that he wasn't seeing when he edited the material. So mm -hmm. the reality is uh, when you're projecting at this kind of a situation, you're going to have to be really careful about how you edit. But then I think many of you know I've been an advocate that the screen size has to be big enough so you can see what you're doing. And um, in HD, I believe the image has to be at least six feet wide. In um, uh, UHD, I believe the image has to be at least 12 feet wide. And someday when this 8K format comes out, we're talking <laughs> about a 24 foot wide screen mm -hmm. uh, being necessary. If you actually want to get out of uh, the system, what can be put into it? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm and you'll see a better picture on your iPhone, but you're not going to um, um, you're you're not going to see um, all that's in the picture on an iPhone or right. on a smaller display, unless you hold it really close to your eyes. Well, and I I, I actually. I actually don't believe that. I actually believe really? the pixels. I, I actually believe the individual pixels have to be just so big in mm -hmm. order in order to see them. And I don't believe uh, the only way you can get that out of a small display is with a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, it it comes from experience with. Uh, smaller displays versus larger displays where the smaller displays have had the exact same resolution as the bigger displays. It's just easier to see what's going on when it's spread out. Mm -hmm. When it's spread out over a much larger area. Right, right. Well, another of the demos that I was very impressed with, and I, I don't know whether you saw it or not, I imagine you did, was the Christie High Dynamic Range demo. Did you get into that one? Uh, yes, I actually got into that one twice. Uh, mm -hmm. because I needed to know more about what was going on because they did both SDR and HDR. Yes. So they did standard dynamic range at 4K and at the same light output as they were doing high dynamic range. So um, among the discussion points in my world is what's the difference between HDR and SDR? And can SDR approximate HDR? Mm -hmm. And of course, 
I'm, I'm actually in the camp that SDR can actually do better than HDR. But at the moment, I'm, I'm concerned that everybody considers that heresy. So, <laughs> we're trying to sell HDR sets. What do you mean H SDR can be better? Well, and, this, this is quite surprising to me, too. So I would like you to elaborate on this. Uh, how is it that SDR can actually perform better than HDR? Well, uh, part of it is uh, the actual dynamic range within a signal for HDR is quite a bit smaller than the dynamic range for SDR. How can that and, be? Oh, and, and, and it has everything to do with the perceptual quantization curve, the PQ curve that's used mm -hmm. for HDR. That curve is an absolute curve, and I actually think I have a graphic of it. Um, yeah, we, somebody, have we have several, yeah, actually. Um, but the one with the 50% is um, the PQ50 is probably the PQ50, best. PQ50, yeah. Uh, that's probably the best graphic to put up at the moment. But the PQ curve is an absolute curve. Over on the left-hand side is the light output. Now, that 10 at the top is 10,000 nits. The 1 is 1,000 nits. The 0.1 is 100 nits. And, of course, 0.01 is 10 nits. Mm -hmm. But that's an absolute curve. Along the bottom is the signal in. So what happens is when you put 50%, a signal that, it has 50% of the dynamic range. It comes up to 100 nits, which is the standard light output for a standard dynamic range TV set. But yep. if you put 100% in, it goes all the way up to 10,000 nits. But there isn't any display that goes to 10,000 nits. If you look really carefully at this diagram, you'll see a line coming out of the yellow line at the 1,000 nit level and then going across and being absolutely flat. In other words, right. TV we sets... Have, we actually, we actually uh, have a, a, a picture of that called... Um, uh, what is it called? Uh, PQ... Uh, PQ limits, it's called. Yes. So let's take a look at PQ limits. All right. What you see is um, uh, if, as an example, you have a display that only has 300 nits... Uh, output. You can you can see if you if you look that that lower line is right about 300 nits, mm -hmm. and what happens is nothing in the signal can go above that, or it will get clipped. Or if you're at the thousand nit level, nothing can go above a thousand nits without being clipped. So what that means is someplace between 63% and about 75% of the signal is the maximum amount of range in that signal you can use for the video. So the video can only go from zero to a maximum of 75%. Where in standard dynamic range, the video can go from zero to 108%. So and that's you, we can take a look at that curve. That's the called the gamma curve, and uh, I believe we have a, a photo yeah, it, of. Uh, it, basically, what happens is in the standard dynamic range, I can use anything from zero to, and that curve keeps right on going. It goes past one, and the video dynamic range allows me to go to about one hundred and eight percent. Mm -hmm. So I can use anything from 0 to 108% for a standard dynamic range signal, but I can only use something from 0 to 75% in a high dynamic range. So the use, If you're for, using PQ, if you're using that you're, particular... Yes, it, because that's what is being used for high dynamic range. For so, the most part, yeah. I think exclusively, I guess. There is it, one other... There is one other curve. There, there is there is the hyper, uh, hybrid log gamma curve uh, that is being proposed by the BBC and uh, NHK, and mm -hmm. it's it's a hybrid between the gamma curve and the PQ curve, but it also has thank you. Uh, it also has those upper limits in it, and well, I thought it, uh, I thought it was relative like gamma. Is that not true? Um, well, it's relative like gamma at the bottom end of the curve, ah. but it's 
fix slot PQ at the top end of the curve. Thus the term hybrid. Yes. Great. Very see how easy see how easy these names are in in, <laughs> in, in describing what they're doing. Yes, um, indeed, indeed. But anyway, so a part of the PQ curve is uh, used in the hybrid log gamma system. And all of the PQ curve is used in the Phillips Technicolor system, the um, Dolby Vision system, and the HDR10 system. So the other three systems use the, um, the, the, use the PQ curve. Um, mm -hmm. Dolby might have an argument that theirs is 12-bit instead of 10-bit uh, because, in fact, Dolby is using a 12-bit system instead of a 10-bit system. So mm -hmm. theirs might be HDR12 instead of HDR10. Uh, you, you might you might be able to call it that, right? HDR10 is is simply 10 bits. But this bring the the bit depth brings up another question for you regarding this amazing statement you have made that you actually prefer SDR. Uh, can look better, I should say, over HDR, and that is bit depth. I mean, if you're going to use the SDR gamma, relative gamma, uh, to to increase the dynamic range of, of an image, because we now have much brighter TVs, uh, don't you need to increase the bit depth as well? Well, uh, I'm, I'm advocating SDR at 10 bits. Ah, okay. uh, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating it. Yeah. Uh, yes, that wasn't qualified. Yes, I am advocating that SDR have the same 10-bit system that the um, HDR has. And I'm advocating the same color for SDR. You know that part PT709, of... PT709, really? No, 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 no. No, HDR is P3. Uh, so it is almost almost everything, at least in HDR10 and Dolby Vision, uh, the color for HDR is P3, mm -hmm. and so I'm advocating the same color for STR. I and understand. Okay, I got I'm it. I'm advocating a 10-bit system, but you see, I'm using much more of that 10-bit dynamic range than the HDR system is using. I'm using a lot more of the dynamic range. So when I make comparisons, there is less contouring, uh, you know, the, the banding that you see in, in pictures. There's, there's less contouring in the picture um, in the SDR image than in the HDR image. There's one other important point. Um, almost every consumer HDR display has a problem of light output versus how much of the area of the picture is being lit up. Mm -hmm. If a large part of the picture is being lit up, then you can't make the 10,000 nit levels. You, it, it the, the 1,000, you mean? You mean the 1,000? Yeah, the 1,000. Yes, I'm sorry. There, yes, are no, there are no consumer TVs that can do 10,000 nits anywhere near it. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the correction. Um, yes. But but what happens is they can't reach those levels. So if, uh, if a large part, if if a large part of the image is is very bright, say a snow scene or something like that. Uh, just, just, just a day scene, just an average day scene. They're, they're, look at the look at the scene behind me. That's a high average picture level. There is a mm -hmm. large part of this picture that is bright, and mm -hmm. and so if you look at the image behind me, uh, that is way too much for uh, one thousand nit levels or five hundred nit levels or three hundred nit levels, whatever uh, whatever you're going to get out. And so, if if somebody does something like the scene you're currently looking at, if they do it in HDR, the maximum light output is going to be five or six hundred nits anyway. Mm. And so, what happens is in SDR, you can run up to five. Or 600 nits, but you can have the entire picture filling the screen at five to 600 nits. So when you start looking at real picture content and the fact that some pictures do have a lot of light, bright area in them, then the SDR comes out looking better than the HDR. Mm. And um, so, and and I know this is this is heresy. Uh, <laughs> been talking about this, but um, 
when I come out with a um, UHD Blu-ray disc in, in conjunction with Florian Friedrich in Munich, uh, when, yeah, when we come out with a disc, um, mm-hmm. um, what's going to happen is there's going to be SDR images on there. And we're actually going to encourage people to look at those SDR images at five or 600 nits. And then the exact same images are going to be in HDR. So they'll be able to go back and forth between SDR and HDR from the same 10-bit P3 images and look for themselves to see uh, what the difference is. I I can't wait. That's going to be fantastic. So uh, we do have works. we do have a picture. We do have a picture. I want to make sure we get to uh, which is the the three different color gamuts or ranges of color. Uh, that we're talking about here. And before we get too far away from that, I want to make sure we take a look at the image called gamuts. Um, And here here we can see, well, you tell us what we're looking at here. Well, um, the inside uh, curve is the 709 curve, the inside triangle, yes, thank you. Uh, The inside triangle (laughs) um, is the color of our current high definition system. The solid line is the color of the uh, digital cinema system and is actually the color that is being used in UHD for high dynamic range. The outside triangle is this very large 2020 color space that um, everybody talks about, this brand new color space for UHD. Well, it turns out that we're putting P3 color inside a 2020 container. So when you get HDR, what's happening is the signal has been color corrected to P3. And that P3 is put inside the 2020 triangle and is carried to your set in the 2020 system. Now, that means your set has got to be able to pull P3 out of that 2020 triangle and it's got to show you P3 colors on your TV set. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a lot of a lot of HDR sets these that, days are, are, are specifying something on the order of 85 or 90 or 90 plus percent of P3. Uh, if there are... That's interesting the way you put that. Now now I'm going to look at the way you were saying things as opposed to my 1,000 nits versus 10,000 nits. But, <laughs> uh, if, if somebody, what they should be saying is this is a certain percentage of 2020 because 2020 is the carrier. Right. It, it's a container. And right. so the specifications, if somebody's actually going, and, and I recognize this isn't happening, I'm shocked to see people specify, oh, gee, this is 97% of NTSC color. Well, mm-hmm. NTSC color hasn't been around since the 1950s. Why I know, the, why I know, they're, okay. <laughs> why, they're referencing, why, they're, why they're referencing NTSC is way beyond me. Yeah. Uh, but in today's world, in the UHD world, they need to be referencing um, 709 P3 or uh, 2020. Incidentally, right. officially, P3 is not a part of the UHD system. It just happens mm. to be the color we're using. And that's the reason, since there isn't any P3 in the UHD system, we actually have to send P3 in the 2020 container. Mm-hmm. And then sets are expected to make P3. In other words, whatever comes in, um, they're expected to make P3 out of it. And mm-hmm. incidentally, that's one of the things that we're going to be testing for uh, in in the um, disc that Florian and I bring out on the market in the near future. We're mm-hmm. actually going to be testing to make sure that we're going to put P3 in the container. And then for anybody who has the capability of measuring what their set's doing, we're going to, the set has to be able to do P3 because Mm -hmm. that's what's in the container. Yeah. Uh, UJ in the chat room is asking, what hardware or software changes would need to be made to today's displays to accommodate your proposed SDR-10? Absolutely no changes whatsoever. Mm. The, um, The sets that are available today do 10 bits and they will do 10 bits with an SDR input. In other words, if if you crank up your Blu-ray player and put an 8-bit disc on it, 
uh, the input is all capable of 10 bits. So there is... Well, in some cases, in some cases. Well, in all uh, HDR cases, you're, yes. You're right. The, the display, you're right. You have to buy a display that has um, a 10-bit capability in order to get 10 bits. Right. Uh, and in um, fact, it needs to be 10-bit from the input all the way to the panel, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And, um, and not that, all are. Well, um, therein lies uh, the theory behind the UHD Alliance certification of a set. Mm -hmm. um, the the Ultra High Definition Alliance has a certification process, and one of the things that they look for or are supposed to be looking for is a 10-bit processing. The this UHD specifications say a minimum a minimum of 10-bit capability. So if someone is actually interested in being able to make this SDR and HDR comparison and or get anything out of their HDR, they have to have a 10-bit set. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're not, they're, not, they're, not going, they're not going to get it if they don't have an HDR set. Right. <laughs> How interesting. You need an HDR set in order to get high... The SDR... Yeah, SDR in order, 10. In, yeah. in order to get the good SDR that I'm uh, proposing that Florian mm -hmm. and I bring out mm -hmm. as a yeah, product. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to make sure, well, there's a m bunch of more things that I want to make sure we touch upon. Uh, but before we do, let me take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Epson. Now, Epson's revolutionary EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The new EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an innovative refillable ink tank. It comes with enough ink to print up to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages, equivalent to about 50 ink cartridge sets. You're loaded and ready to print for up to two years. Powered by Epson's leading-edge precision core technology, it delivers high-speed, vivid colors and laser-quality black text. Plus, auto two-sided printing, a 30-page auto document feeder, and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. It's no wonder the ET4550 printer was named a CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value with ultra-low-cost replacement ink bottles. Now you have the freedom to print without running out of ink. Visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the new Epson EcoTank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson very much for their support of home theater geeks. Epson, exceed your vision. Of how so, they're Joe, working in a different color space. The CMY face, <laughs> CMY case in. face is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I know, I know. In fact, I've always found it fascinating that printed color and emissive color, like coming off of a TV screen, are completely different. For example, you combine red, green, and blue on an emissive screen like TV and you get white. You combine those three in a printed medium and you get black. Yes, <laughs> It's like what? <laughs> it's yeah, really, it, really it, quite amazing. It, it's uh, I'm I'm actually pleased to to see that to to be able to talk about the difference between printing and um, um, emissive color systems. Mm -hmm. But anyway, mm -hmm. on to more about NAB. Back to NAB, and one thing I definitely wanted to touch base with you on is Technicolor. Now, Technicolor was at NAB, and they were showing their HDR system which is now a combination of what they had been working on and what Philips had been working on. Apparently, they got together, combined their two systems or did whatever. Now it's a, a joint venture, shall we say. And they were showing a, a pretty interesting HDR demo. Uh, tell us what you saw there and what you thought of it. The interesting part of what I saw this time around was that it is a 10-bit system. And it is using the perceptual quantization curve for HDR. So mm -hmm. in that sense, um, it is much more closely following 
what other people have been advocating in the system. Now, they're claiming, or I have to be careful how I say this, but um, their proposal is for a completely backward compatible system. In mm -hmm. other words, HDR and SDR is in the same signal. Um, and by the way, by the way, we were just looking at a photo of the setup that they had there. Three, and let me just describe this really quickly before you go on. Three different, uh, they were Samsung uh, JS 9500 TVs, 65 inches, I believe, all of which are HDR capable. The first one on the left has the original HDR signal that that just came straight off the server right into that TV. The middle one has the HDR signal as encoded by the Technicolor system. And the far right one has the SDR signal that is part of the Technicolor encoding, which you're about to tell us about. And part of the reason for this demo was to, to, to see that the far left and the center uh, screens should look very close to the same. And the right screen would look different because it was, in fact, SDR, uh, not in its HDR mode. So just wanted to make sure that people understood this picture we were seeing. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, tell us about this system. I'm going to tell you what I understood of their presentation. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're saying that the broadcaster... Um, because it, they are advocating this is a potential um, broadcast system, or yep. the, the the content provider. Let's just say <laughs> the content provider, however, gets to the consumer. The mm -hmm. content provider can start out with either SDR or HDR. And this system will create whichever version is missing. So right. um, if we start out with HDR, it will create an SDR. If you start out with an SDR, it will create an HDR. Then it encodes both signals on a single path. So the transmission path that conveys the information from them to you, whether it's over the top or broadcast or however it happens to get to you, mm -hmm. it contains both signals. And the way and they then, explained it to me was it was basically the SDR signal with HDR metadata that would tell the TV how to display HDR if it had that capability. Yes. And, and um, that and I'm going to tell the words are quite similar to the original description for Dolby Vision. Mm. where Dolby Vision said that the primary, they were going to do it in a layered system where the primary layer was going to be an 8-bit SDR and a secondary layer was going to be a 12-bit HDR. Mm -hmm. And it would be metadata that would tell you how, it would be metadata plus a bit of augmentation information that would tell you how to get from the SDR to the HDR. Right. So, um, so the, if you're receiving the signal, no matter what set you're looking at it on, you're going to you're going to get a picture that's appropriate for the set. Right. And interestingly, and, the SD if a, if an SDR set gets it, a legacy TV, it's just going to ignore the metadata. It doesn't need anything special. It's just going to display the SDR signal. In order to display the HDR signal, it's going to need the TV is going to need a Technicolor decoder in order yes. to understand that metadata. Now, the two things that were new to me about this proposal was that it is 10 bits and it is using the PQ curve. I never got that out of any presentation that either Philips or Technicolor had made prior to that, including the presentation they made just recently at the Consumer Electronics Show. This is right. the very first time I've heard 10 bits PQ for the HDR. Oh, very now, interesting. It, this is what I'm, it's part of what I'm saying. I, I want to emphasize this is what I heard in the presentation. Sure. And I even asked because this was different from anything I had heard from them before. And the pictures look like 10 bit for the very first time. This was the first time I had seen any of their presentations look like 10 bits. Right. And I remember you telling me. Uh, CES a year ago, not this last one, but the one before, you had seen a Technicolor demo, and you 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 said to me, "Man, that was eight bits." Yes, and that that's part of what had uh, had be 
dismissing. Concerned, yeah. <laughs> uh, concerned, dismissing, whatever, whatever word. Um, dismissing the proposals uh, between both Phillips and Technicolor because I wasn't seeing any 10-bit presentations. Mm -hmm. And um, the dynamic range that I was seeing wasn't the large difference that I'm used to seeing between SDR and HDR in displays. It, 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 it was just a little bit better. But now that they're saying, okay, this is going to be the PQ curve for HDR, at least if I heard right, and if that's what they're actually doing, they're following the same steps that are being used in the Dolby Vision system and the HDR10 system. So their ability to use existing sets like the Samsung set or the Sony or LG or whoever, uh, whoever is supporting um, HDR10, they now have a platform to play into. So I'm pleased with what I heard, and I hope that what I heard is real. Uh, <laughs> words, I, uh, I hope that I didn't um, get something wrong. Now, yeah. the one thing that I did get out of this uh, that is the same for the hybrid log, log gamma system my understanding of what they presented is that there is a single color between the two systems. Uh, and this is my understanding of the hybrid log gamma system as well, that they cannot accommodate uh, P3 or 2020 uh, for HDR and 709 for SDR. Really? I so see this as, I, see, I actually see it as, as good because it just we're just going to push everything to P3. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. um, all right, I, all right. I, can I, want, that. I want SDR to be P3. Mm -hmm. I, there is an advantage in color, and that that advantage is worthwhile in SDR as much as it is in HDR. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I want SDR to have that advantage, and there's no reason why it shouldn't. So again, this is what I got out of their presentation, and I hope I'm right, but it, it was an it was an encouraging set of circumstances like, okay, they're stepping up and they're playing the game by a set of rules that I can get behind. Right, exactly. One of the things that I heard at that demo, you might probably did too, which I found interesting was that on the input side, as before they're encoding, they can accept any uh, what's called EOTF, electro-optical transfer function, which is really what PQ is, what gamma is, uh, what hybrid log gamma is. Uh, they can accept any of those. They even said there was there's the Chinese, whoever the Chinese are, are developing a new EOTF, something different. And th th theirs is, their Technicolor system is completely agnostic. They can accept any of those and output PQ, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, that's certainly, uh, it's certainly something that uh, is potentially feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, I have issues uh, with what I've seen of SDR to uh, HDR or HDR to SDR conversions where mm -hmm. anything less than 12 bits was involved in the process. Now, the fact that they're controlling the process, it could be 16 bits. Um, not that there's a lot of 16-bit sources that they could work with, but... Um, well, but that would allow some computational headroom, would it not? Uh, yes. And and actually, the computational power required to get between those two systems is pretty significant. Mm. Now, Dolby is even using a completely different component system than our current television system, uh, claiming that uh, IC, ICTP... I, I C T C P. Now, I'll remember that. Um, instead of uh, Y C R C B, they're mm. using a different system in Dolby Vision uh, to go between S D R and H D R because there is a much more linear transform between the two. In using Y C R C B, which is our current component video system, the transition between H D R and S D R is not linear and it's not a straight line and it is mathematically complicated to do 
um, presumably requiring at least 12 bits to do a halfway decent job of a fixed conversion, let alone compensating for any variables some artists would like to make uh, between the uh, HDR and SDR version. By the so, way, just, F just FYI, for those who don't know, YCBCR and I, whatever that was you said. ICTCP. Yes, are different. ICTCP. I, I is in Indigo, and then yeah. C is in Charlie. Uh, CT is in Tango, and then CP so it's instead of YCRCB, it's ICPCT. <laughs> In any event, what I wanted to just say was that those are different ways of representing color in the video system. Um, and YCBCR is what we now use. Dolby is transforming with a, with a different mathematical description of the colors that we're using. And that's really what those are. And I just wanted to sort of give people a background on that. Yes, and that's that's a good thing um, to provide a background. That um, Dolby is claiming an easier conversion between HDR and SDR because they're in a uh, different domain than the YCRCB domain, and I'm still learning about this. I'm still uh, I'm still trying to uh, figure all of this out so I can so I can get it. Uh, mm -hmm. straight in my own mind. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it'll come. Uh, Mahler Music in the chat room is asking uh, <clears throat> or stating, I remember seeing that an SDR TV can read Dolby Vision. Is that true? And the answer is yes. It's Dolby Vision is designed to be backward compatible as the Technicolor system is and as HDR10 is not. Well, uh, there's a little caveat in that okay and that um where dolby can predict that there will be a converter of their control and design they're only putting hdr in in their their path so as an example if if, if you were to have a blu-ray disc um the players that are certified as Dolby Vision players would have this ICTCP decoder in it and mm -hmm. be able to make the transformation. So there's no point in, in including um, SDR in the signal. So as much oh, as see, I thought, this, I thought, it, I thought Dolby Vision was though was was basically an SDR with an HDR metadata enhancement layer, and, and then an SDR what, set would just ignore it if it didn't if it didn't have the proper decoder. And what I'm finding out is that there is a single layer version of Dolby Vision uh, that is HDR. And that single layer version is probably what's going to go on um, the Ultra HD Blu-ray disc because any Blu-ray disc player or any TV set that is Dolby Vision certified is actually going to have the capability of uh, converting the HDR to SDR. So why bother putting the SDR on the signal in the first place? Mm, good point. It makes a lot of sense to me. It, yeah, okay. It, All right. But those are the kinds of things that come out when you start asking questions. Man, oh man, this whole thing is like another order of magnitude more complex than what we've had before. <laughs> we're not done yet. And we're not even done yet. <laughs> Well, there's one other demo I wanted to quickly touch upon. Uh, did you see the Samsung demo of a static versus dynamic, dynamic tone map? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, what did you think of that? It, it looked good. Um, the important thing to understand, if we were to go back to that uh, curve that had a 300-nit clip and a 1,000-nit clip, the PQ curve the that had PQ multiple... Curve, yeah. Yeah. Well, EQ limits, it's called. It's called yeah, EQ the, limits. Let's pull that back up if we could. If we go back could. to that curve, um, what you're going to see is the bottom white line represents uh, one kind of TV technology, and the top white line uh, that clips represents another TV technology. Well, if we, uh, let's say we mastered at 4,000 nits, which goes up further than either of the two sets represented in the curves, if we just let the signal go through, everything would be clipped above the limit of either of the sets. 
And so the sets have to do something called tone mapping. And they have to recognize, oh my gosh, this master was done at 4,000 nits, but gee, my set can only do 300 nits. So I have to tone map everything from 300 nits up to 4,000 nits. I have to tone map it down to something that my 300 nit HDR display can deal with. Mm -hmm. And so there is now tone mapping that happens, and it happens above the 50% point. Every set is expected to be able to to deal with HDR up to the 50% point, including digital cinema. Incidentally, mm. digital cinema, the light output of that is 100 nits. Well, mm -hmm. 100 nits is at the 50% point. So, and Dolby Vision is using PQ. Yes. So it, Dolby Vision Cinema HDR is yes. using PQ. That's what I meant to say. Thank you for being more complete than me. <laughs> no, no. Well, but as a I, result, I, I, yes. As a result, it's only it's only using half of the range of PQ. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and at, at twelve bits, that works. Mm -hmm. that if you've got if you've got twelve bits to convey the signal, only using fifty percent works. But gee, if you had 10 bits and you were only using 50%, that's only twice as good as 8 bits. Remember, 10 bits is four times the resolution of 8 bits. Mm -hmm. And so if you're only using half of the 10-bit space, then you're only twice as good as 8 bits. You know, mm -hmm. You're not enough better than 8 bits to... Uh, yeah. um, there goes me doubting everything. I... Of course, <laughs> I, I I want 12 bits, minimally 12 bits sure. delivered to the consumer. And of course, sure. the UHD Alliance specifications say a minimum of 10 bits. They aren't saying that you can't deliver 12 bits or 16 bits. They're saying it has to be a minimum of 10 in order right. to qualify. Um, and so, of course, that's what everyone's going for because it's the least they have to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, getting back to Samsung dynamic versus uh, uh, static tone mapping, uh, there's a picture called um, Samsung Graph, uh, which which we can take a look at, which actually is a photo of a TV uh, that, that was showing this graphic. Yes. And so here, uh, <clears throat> so you can help uh, Joe explain what, well, what we're looking at here. They're basically... Um they're basically showing you how they're bending the curve. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they're actually looking at the entire picture. They're looking at the overall, uh, the, the average area and how much um, is consumed. Um, and what they're doing is they're bending the curve depending on the picture. Uh, static was a fixed curve that we just, we just applied a fixed curve. But with dynamic, that dynamic curve, that red curve, can stretch out to the green curve, or it can come back, if necessary, uh, to handle the dynamic range. So that depending on the picture, yeah. Right, if there isn't a lot of dynamic range in the picture, then we can use the red curve. If there is a lot of dynamic range in the picture, then we can use the green curve, and we can use anything in between. Yes. Yes. And so that's that's actually there was a sliding scale. Uh, this was an active presentation where there was a yes. sliding scale going from the green curve to the red curve. So the right. green and curve it, and the red could curve be anything in between. Limits. Yes, show the limits of what can be done. Mm -hmm. But this is this is what I'm calling tone mapping. Mm -hmm. And um, so they have an ability to look at a signal and gee, if a signal goes up to four thousand nits and the TV set is only capable of a thousand nits or nine hundred or seven hundred or whatever it happens. Whatever to be, it is, yeah. This dynamic can make the picture look better in that it can as far as light output um, is concerned, it can make the picture look better with less clipping in the picture uh, that might otherwise occur uh, because of the uh, um, changes in dynamic range. Mm -hmm. I took so, I took a couple of course. pictures. Uh, I took a couple pictures of the of the set doing a dynamic and a static uh, uh, tone mapping and photographs. We're going to talk about photographs here in a second because you've taken some as well. But these ones were were more informal. If we can take a look at Samsung static, uh, we can see an image that was shown there. 
in, in static uh, tone mapping. And then we switch that to the dynamic one. And obviously the fire is brighter. Uh, and we, if we go back and forth a bit, we can sort of see the difference. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a photograph of a TV screen taken with a camera that isn't necessarily high dynamic range, but it gives you some idea. Yeah. Um, actually, in true high dynamic range, the exact opposite would happen in high dynamic range. If you look at the low picture, you can see there's that, much more detail in the fire. Correct. In a true high dynamic range set, that detail would be preserved. Right. Um, but that is what that is what it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It is what now the camera captured. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but th this brings me to some of your photos that I really wanted to make sure we talked about. Um, for example, you took one, uh, I don't know if it was at this trip or some other trip. You've been to Vegas as many times or more than I have. Uh, but the one called HDRLV yes, was taken, uh, uh, that I this called is, that. Yeah, this is a single frame out of a high dynamic range sequence that I shot. Um, I shot uh, over a 16-hour period. So I shot... Um, uh, daylight into dusk into late night. And then, of course, uh, the area over the Bellagio, uh, you see the pool lighting up and see traffic and um, uh, you uh, see all sorts of activity going on in the city. Mm -hmm. And then I shot back into coming up into morning light. So uh, some of the uh, demonstration material that will be on our new disc. Uh, that's a single picture from it, and you're going to be able to see lots of colors. Obviously, Las Vegas can challenge uh, any color <laughs> any spectrum. Any camera, yes. And, of course, <laughs> that's obviously challenging dynamic range as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it, just, it just seemed like a perfect um, place to have uh, pictures, you know, color and dynamic range, um, in a single picture, but that's that's one of the scenes that's going to be part of our uh, demonstration material uh, mm -hmm. from the new disc. Let's take a look then at HDR one A and one B, uh, which are two images that you that you took, and tell us what here, we're looking at here. Here, I'm trying to show you what high dynamic range should be able to bring us. This is an average dynamic range picture where the sky, uh, because it has to go white, you, you just can't have color in it. But if you go to the next frame, uh, you're going to see there's actually color in that sky. And mm -hmm. a high dynamic range, That's this is the equivalent to the fire that you saw uh, in the AB uh, comparison yes. you made. Yep. And if you go back and forth, thank you, in going back and forth between the two of them, what you see in high dynamic range the information in the sky is there. And when you have 10 bits and when you have a bigger color space, you can actually reproduce what the sky actually looks like in a high dynamic range picture. Now, mm -hmm. that high dynamic range can be a 10-bit SDR image. That's, that's what's important to me is I can pull that off in a 10-bit SDR image. It's the, it's the bit depth and the color space that allows me to do this. And so I'm actually going to be able to show you that sky in SDR only because I'm going to be providing it as 10-bit. And the color quality, of course, will be because it's going to be in P3. Mm -hmm. And so my well, SDR images are going to come much closer to the HDR images than I think you've ever seen before. Now, didn't you, uh, we, we've been talking about your idea, kind of radical, of, of SDR, standard dynamic range, in 10-bit, P3 color, uh, approaching the quality of image that HDR offers anyway. Uh, didn't I also hear you say, though, that you would want a higher peak luminance? Because SDR currently is sort of pegged to 100 nits. And that's what it's mastered to, and that's what we, we, uh, calibrated TVs at home will show. But you, but are are you also advocating pushing that up? The answer to that is yes. 
uh, there are certainly caveats in that, yes. Mm. Um, in other words, you can't push the light output up without a bit depth to support it. Right. Uh, so I'm not advocating pushing the light output up on an 8-bit picture. Right. In fact, um, among the things that I have to understand in the industry, uh, the reason we came up with the PQ curve, was, or one of the reasons we came up with the PQ curve, was that it is said that the gamma curve runs out of gas my way of putting it, Run, runs out of gas at 1,000, or I'm sorry, at 100 nits. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with that if the display is a CRT and the bit depth is 8 bits. I, mm. I can absolutely see that the CRT is going to go into clipping, it's going to go into blooming, it's, you know, uh, it's going to lose it, anything above 100 nits. And if you go much above 100 nits on a CRT, you're going to see contouring in the picture. But if you take that same picture, the same gamma, and run in, into a set that's capable of 500 nits and a 10-bit or a 12-bit capability, I actually think the gamma will support that. I'm not seeing the fall off that everybody is graphing. And all, this, all these graphs that were used to justify the PQ curve I think we're based on an 8-bit CRT as as the characteristic for the gamma of 2.4. Mm. But as I don't I don't see how in, in the displays I'm looking at up to 500 nits. I don't see the displays running running into the same kind of trouble that the CRTs ran into at 100 nits. Mm. And mm. so um I need help in understanding what someone means when they say that the gamma curve runs out of gas. Um, at the Christie display that we talked about, uh, mm -hmm. they talked about the 2.6 gamma curve running out of gas at 400 nits. And um, 2.6 is, is the is digital the cinema curve? Yes, that's the digital cinema curve. So, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm, trying to be technically accurate because everything they were doing was at a 2.6 uh, mm -hmm. or everything that they told me they were doing was at a 2.6 <laughs> curve. And mm -hmm. I still haven't, I, no, whatever. Uh, it, they, they said it was 2.6. And so, you know, w without making measurements, I, I have no idea if that's what right. it was or not. Right. But um, they said the 2.6 curve ran out of gas at about 400 nits. I, and they were and they were showing things at 200 nits, so they were they felt justified. They were way below. Yes, they were way below that. Incidentally, I I found that 200 nits on a 16 foot wide screen to be absolutely jarring. When they went from a dark scene, my eyes don't iris down that fast, mm -hmm. and it was I had to shut my eyes when. Wow. When, when bright scenes came up in their demonstration. Um, it was close your eyes and, you know, yeah. it, it's like, I will okay, say this is yeah. way too much. I agree. And in particular, there were, uh, they started with sort of a demonstration of here's the black level you'd normally see in a, in a digital cinema. And it's gray, obviously. You, yeah. the, the presenter cast a shadow on the screen. Okay, here it is in high dynamic range and the black, the screen literally disappeared. Um, and then they showed, there was a, some part of a, of a sort of deep space kind of, documentary thing that was all very dark yeah. and then they went to mad max <laughs> which so yeah. so well, it was it, that was pretty jarring i agree even even in the sdr demonstrations they uh there was a point where they went from a fairly dark scene to a very bright scene mm. and it was at that point that it was like no my eyes are not dealing with this <laughs> and um is i literally shut my eyes because it was so bright Mm -hmm. and well, this is what some people complain about in terms of uh, HDR and thousand nit displays and and the Dolby reference monitor, which is four thousand nits. It's like yeah. squinting. Well, we have some time left. Um, one of the things I'd like to bring up is ambient light levels when watching HDR. By golly, that was the next point I was going to bring up. <laughs> oh, and to think that I wasn't even reading the list. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> 
And I, I'm worried that we're going to run out of time and we won't well, have had time to mention this. Well, we are getting it, close. So let's, let's uh, end with this. That's great. It, in the HDR system, um, the majority of picture content is not above 100 nits. We showed you the 50% line going out to 100 mm -hmm. nits on the graph. Right. And so that's actually how you set contrast in HDR. You set 50% at 100 nits. So mm -hmm. what that's saying is the light output in HDR is actually going to be lower than it might be on your set if you ran the light output in the Calday mode, as an example, mm -hmm. um, in, in a set. So... The average picture level of HDR is actually going to be dimmer than most consumers would run SDR in their home. That is so means, weird. It means that ambient light is going to have to be much more tightly controlled for an HDR set than for an SDR set. Mm -hmm. And you can't, if you've ever looked at the controls for HDR, they're at 100%. The LCD right, the backlight, backlight is mm -hmm. at 100%. The contrast is at 100%. You can and you not, can't change those. You cannot turn HDR up any higher than yeah. it is. And the average picture content is down below 100 nits. So you're actually going to have to control ambient light, the environment of the HDR display more than an SDR display. Incidentally, and people complain part, about that all the time. Yeah, that's a, actually part of the reason I want to do SDR because, hey, you can turn it up. And I, I want to do 10-bit SDR and you can turn it up and you can get HDR levels out of it and you can do that in a higher ambient light than you could for an HDR signal. Wow. Does this make bias lighting even more important as well? In my opinion, yes. Now, mm. because the peak whites in HDR are going to go above the 100 nit level, obviously 300 nits to 1,000 nits or whatever, mm -hmm. I believe the level of the light from the light behind the set is going to have to be slightly greater than it would have been at a 100 nit level for SDR viewing. Mm. Just as I've long advocated, if you, if you turn the contrast control up, the set will turn the bias light up too. Mm. And it's the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah uh, among the things that you're going to see in the near future is um, bias lights that can be turned up and down in level. Mm. Which uh, I guess we don't see now. I mean, bias lighting, just for those who don't know, is you, you put a light behind your TV. And it, this is for direct emissive LCD type TVs mm -hmm. uh, to, to sort of bring the dynamic range of your visual system in line with what the TV is putting out. Uh, so it, it uh, reduces eye strain and, and is generally generally considered a good thing. Uh, it has to be typically 10% of peak white, which... Maximum for a, 10%. Maximum. Yeah. Maximum uh, 10%. Right. And um, it, it has to be a certain color of white, the, what we call D65, the same as mm -hmm. well, hopefully what your TV is calibrated to. Uh, and and then it works. But the, the certainly the bias light I have from um, CinemaQuest does mm -hmm. not have a... a a dial that lets you change the output, the brightness. Well, and I believe that's going to be necessary because consumers are going to be switching back and forth between SDR and HDR. Mm -hmm. And I actually believe that the light should be slightly brighter um, if we're looking at HDR than SDR. So I think the future of bias lights is going to require some steps in um in where it comes, you know, what the light, how the light comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, to your point, Mike Heiss in the chat room is saying, uh, and I've heard this too, he's, he's heard people say that post graders, people, people in the post production who grade uh, in these dark rooms need to spend 30 minutes or so in a dark room before they start grading because their eyes need to be again, accommodated to, to the darkened environment. And I think that's probably more important now if, if they're grading in HDR. 
Okay. Well, I would agree with that statement. If if the person grading is grading in a room without a bias light, there are several. Unfortunately, there are several uh, facilities here in Hollywood that don't have bias lights, and it takes mm. it takes a lot of time to get used to that. And then, of course, there's the fatigue that sets in without the bias light being there. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, the bias, the idea of the bias light is supposed to fix. Uh, your adjustment period is supposed to help the adjustment period so that it doesn't take long to get used to the light of the set. And uh, you can work at prolonged times without fatigue, mm -hmm. without optic fatigue setting in. Or in the case of the consumer, you can watch TV for a long time without fatigue setting in. <laughs> yes, yes. Somebody in the chat room said, so return of Philips Ambilight, perhaps? <laughs> this was a system uh, for, on Philips TVs that, you know, basically changed colors according to what was on the screen. And it was stupid and it was not a bias light. Yeah. Well, um, but the concept um, yes. now is that I, I need to be able to adjust. I, I need some control over the ambient light, depending on what I'm watching. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's going to be a future bias lighting. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, we've, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour and there's so much more to talk about, but uh, as always more to talk about than we have time to, to talk about it. So uh, I hope you'll come back sometime and continue this great discussion. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you. That's Joe Kane of Joe Kane Productions. His website is videoessentials.com. And I highly recommend that you go and check that out because there's a ton of great stuff there. And as soon as uh, this new HDR content is available, I'm sure we'll learn about it at videoessentials.com. You can find me at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv. And uh, that's twit.tv slash htg, I should say. And also on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Larry Pace, the president of Darby Vision, makers of a very well-respected video processor. And we're going to be talking about what's what's new at Darby Vision and what's coming down the pike for them. So I do hope you will in, you will join me for that. Now I will tell you that we are pre-recording that show on Friday, January uh, April 29th, which by the way of this recording is tomorrow, from at 11 o'clock in the morning, 11 to 12. So if you happen to be around and want to tune in to live.twit.tv, you can see us record the show. Otherwise, it'll be aired next week, next Thursday at the normally scheduled time. So I do hope you will join us one way or the other. Until then, geek out. <laughs>